Yeah, yeah. Guys, it's two o'clock. We're going to head, go ahead and um, get this meeting started. We've got we've got a a bill that we're going to take up first, um, and then I want to make sure we uh, we vetted that bill pretty heavily in in subcommittee uh, and I I want to quickly then you know as quick as we can I will we'll pay due attention to it but as quick as we can I want to you know get that bill uh, out if that's the will of the committee and uh, and then I want to move on because I know we've we've got uh, we've got some folks from oh well now come on <clears throat> Representative Tarvin, we've also now, I know you're in the mountains, but we've got some folks from the coast who have come a long ways. And I'm going to tell you, they got an interesting presentation that I think the whole committee and some folks from, you know, out there in the audience uh, will also like to hear. But with that, let's, let's go ahead and take up the first item of business, and that is uh, before you, you have uh, the uh, Game Fish and Parks Committee substitute on House Bill 208 LC number 401401ERS. And with that, I'm going to let uh, uh, Governor Floyd or Representative Rhodes, if you will, begin your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Uh, test it now. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, members of the committee. I'll bring before you today a uh, substitute to HB 208. I'm going to go through this real quickly. It's very. Uh -oh. Hold on, guys. Okay. Hold on a second. We, we, you know, it, it's funny how everybody wants to be on the Game Fish and Parks Committee, but they can't show up. So I'm. I'm um, how many are we short of a quorum? Do we get enough? Well, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer leg council. Okay, that's what I'm deferring to you. We get all right. Hold on, we the presenter of the bill. Yes, he is on the committee. So with that, I believe we do have a quorum. Is that correct? All right, let's go. We got a quorum, guys. below the southeastern averages. This legislation adjusts license fees to align with the averages in the southeast. It also simplifies the recreational hunting and fishing license structure. It will also make license purchasing process easier and more customer friendly by eliminating and combining the licenses. As many of you know, federal excise taxes are placed on the purchase of firearms, ammunition, and hunting and fishing equipment. States draw back those federal dollars based on a formula that largely considers the number of licenses sold. This legislation enables Georgia to return significantly more federal funds that Georgians have already paid back to our home state. With the additional revenue, DNR plans to fill approximately 40 game warden positions. Currently, we have 47 counties in Georgia without a game warden. Additionally, DNR will improve access and opportunity for our state sportsmen. We will accomplish this with more and better roads to public lands, improve wildlife habitat on wildlife management areas, and fish habitat in public waters. They have listened to Georgians and will provide more and better shooting ranges, boat ramp expansion and improvements, and additional field staff with a focus on public lands. Furthermore, in thinking long term, this added revenue will invest in future sportsmen and women by increasing youth outreach and education and ensuring that our public, publicly managed property is here for generations to come. This legislation is a result of eight public forums and multiple online surveys to assess constituent reactions conducted by the DNR. With more than 5,000 people who gave feedback, they have found that 85% strongly support this initiative. Our constituents, constituents don't want to see the money they spend on their hooks and bullets go to Alabama or South Carolina. They want their investment to come back home to the state of Georgia. And just to give you a few uh, 
quick hits on the, the bill that was slightly different than what Chairman Nimmer uh, carried last year. There was a change to the definition on residency. It just made the uh, residency requirement more clear for the lifetime license. And in this bill, we actually combined the Georgia waterfowl stamp and the HIP permit into one. Um, the fee changes that were different from the bill that Chairman Nimmer car uh, carried was the voter registration fees. And just take note of those fees and the changes. These are three-year fees. Um, we eliminated the two-year license. We don't need the two-year license, and we can go in and stack license on top of one another, so we did away with that. And then for the shrimp trawlers, um, we made it so they can go in and buy a license for their whole crew versus having to have individual commercial fishing license for each individual crew member. That way if they four didn't show up and they had to go pick up four, they didn't have to go stop somewhere and buy four more licenses. Um, so that is basically it. Um, there, was, there was one new little thing in there. There was some cap language. And um, is Wes here? Is it? What's the little legal determination for that, that cap language? The 20% cap was added as an accountability measure solely so that our customers know that we're not looking to come back every year and do a 100% increase on hunting and fishing licenses. It's an accountability measure so that our customers know that this is really a one-time increase to get towards the southeastern average where we need to be, and then moving forward, 20% is enough room for us to operate within to um, consistently move within that average and uh, get to that point where we need to. Okay, thank you, Wes. Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. Okay. All right. And who's six? I'm not going to answer any of his questions. Uh, I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, Chairman Nimmer, and by the way, I, I do what, all seriousness, you know, this bill, guys, real quick, and I should have stated this earlier on, but, you know, this was a bill that we saw last year, and there's a great, great need for this. Hunters and fishermen have always paid the way you've heard it. And, um, you know, we're, we're going back, you know, 1990, I think it was two was the last time. So, you know, I, I think, you know, they want to come in and put more of their money back into their resources, make sure we're continuing that opportunity there. And uh, last year, as you know, this is the, with, with just very, very minor changes. This is the same bill that uh, uh, Chairman Nimmer and myself uh, introduced last year. So with that, Chairman Nimmer. Thank you, Chairman Knight. Represent <laughs> Representative Rhodes, you yield for a question? <laughs> I, I do unwilling, not not really wanting to. Yes, sir. Was that a yes or no? <laughs> I, I guess so, shoot. I just, uh, well, being this is a hunting bill, I may force over with, but uh, you said first time in 25 years, correct? Yes, sir. That's All correct. right. I, I appreciate you bringing this forward, but I couldn't help but notice one one consistent message. I, I was here, and I don't know if everybody else did throughout your presentation, uh, was that, that Representative Nimmer, which would be me, from you carried this bill last year. That is correct. Uh, kept kept talking about the efforts I had into it, and even Chairman Knight just mentioned it again. <laughs> can can you go ahead and elaborate on my shortcomings and why I wasn't able to get such a good measure <laughs> across the I, finish line? You did line? a great job. I just think it was luck of the draw this year. Luck of the draw. Well, uh -huh. you, you further yield. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's very bright, but I will one more time. <laughs> Chairman Mayor. I noticed uh, we got a senator in the room with us. Does that build your confidence to present this kind of bill that I couldn't get through last year? Or I think he, he was coming to see if he could pick something up from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he's in trouble. <laughs> he's in trouble. No, in all seriousness, Representative Rhodes, I appreciate you uh, picking this measure up from last year. I think it's very important and vital uh, for the DNR, for our, for our state. Uh, moving forward, and I, I'm very passionate about what they do uh, in that agency, and I appreciate you picking the measure up and, and carrying it on this year. So thank well, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate you laying the groundwork for us on this measure. Any other questions from members of the committee? All right. Representative Donahue, Friday okay? 
Yes, yes. thank right. you. And, and thank you all again. We uh, appreciate the effort last year, and there was a few things that we asked, and, and I do appreciate that, coming back in the substitute. Um, one of the things I just want to clarify, for instance, if uh, – I have a grandson that's six months old. I'm still going to go out and buy him a license for $200 now. And when my granddaughter or grandson that's about to be born, hopefully in the next five and a half months, I'm going to do the same there. So uh, with the increase, our, I think our main goal is to start to look at getting our young people back into the cycle of hunting, fishing, outdoors. So again, I appreciate that. Wanted to check and make sure, and I, I think Mr. Chairman, you and I went over this, but I did sleep last night. Um, when you're 65 years or older, you can buy that lifetime license at $70. Is that correct? And that's? Yes, sir. If you look on page five of the bill, uh, line 146, and that's, I guess that, that would be the, the senior, both hunting and fishing. And I think what we've got here, if you look on 147, 148, you know, if we've got a senior who only hunts, they can do it for $35. Yes, sir. And then if you've got a senior that only fishes, they can do it for, thir uh, again, for $35. So give them very much an option uh, there. And, you know, what I, I, I do like about this, uh, again, is, is that y'all understand the PR and DJ dollars. And, and traditionally, we've had a lot of, you know, our seniors and a lot of folks who haven't paid, but the feds will not let us count those license or those folks as a license to draw down the Pittman Robinson or the Dingle Johnson dollars, those hunting and fishing dollars, which are the excise tax that, that, that we, I don't care how you are, when you go buy your hunting equipment, your guns, your ammo, or your fishing rod, and your lures, your boats and stuff, they're paying that tax, but it's just like, uh, you know, Representative Rhodes said, if they're not getting counted, that money's going to another state. And, I, you know, every time I talk to somebody about this, they, they can't believe it because they, they really don't understand it. And I think this is a good way for letting them contribute, but at a great level, but also more so let them know that, that all that money that is embedded in their hunting and fishing equipment that is that excise tax is going to come back to Georgia. So, great question. Thank you. Um, my friend from the coast, did you bring your shrimp up this way? Well, I refused to answer from grounds. <laughs> 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 Not this week. I get a little slim this time of the year, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, uh, it's light right, right here. Um, Are we going to show another video? What, will y'all show? We'll, we'll shut that on. Or and then when we get ready. When we get ready. Will you? Yeah, we cut that line off. There thank you go. You, thank you. We need sunglasses over here, don't we, guys? <laughs> thank you, Representative Rowe, for bringing this piece of legislation, and I appreciate how you handled yourself with my dear friend from the coast. But Representative Rowe, he's going to take a good lesson on how to handle a piece of legislation from this new legislator. <laughs> but listen, is it is it not true, is it not a fact that if we all could do everything that we could without charging anybody anything, that would be an ideal world. That would be perfect, yes, sir. But, but it's also true that we can't sustain what's necessary to make sure our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren enjoy this without some fees and costs. And plus, it's like... When I was in college, I was in the car business. I sold new cars, and the guy who owned the dealership was named Julius Kaminsky. He said, never sell a man a car with no down payment because he ain't got no skin in the game and he'll do anything to the car. It does help to have an investment in the future of our natural resources in Georgia. And we want to continue to have one of the best programs in the world, and when you in this nation when you have not done any real increases since 1992. It's just not realistic. Everything else has gone up significantly. And there's no reason in the world, y'all know how I feel about the deer in southeast Georgia. I still have a problem with killing one at the height of the joy of his life. 
I mean, that's yeah. terrible. Well, what I mean is, the only time to kill a deer is in the rut. He's beautiful. He doesn't care about the size of your weapon. <laughs> he only cares about one thing, and we go out and kill them. Since they must go, it should be southeast Georgia where they go. At least they died in a happy land. <laughs> you, I appreciate you bringing this bill. It is, it is critical because what we fail to remember sometimes in the legislature is things we do this year. Sometimes it takes years to pay dividends, and if we don't do them, years down the road, you pay terribly for not having done them. I don't ever want to be back in a, in a state as a boy when you didn't see turkeys, you didn't see deer. I mean, it just were all about God. I don't want to go back there. So we need to do what we need to do to sustain what we have now. Thank you for this bill, and thank the department for the work that they do, because no matter what the bill, if we don't have the people to make it happen, there are going to be no results. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative Williams. Um, real quick, I know if, if there's no more discussion, or if there are any more questions from the committee, I'll be happy to take them, but I know that in subcommittee we did have some folks speak uh, to the bill uh, all uh, positively, and I don't want to go back up and, and necessarily repeat all, but if there's some folks in the audience that wants to briefly stand up, identify yourself, talk about the bill, please feel free to. Um, but I, I will let you know that we have letters of support from the National Wild Turkey Federation. We have letters of support from the Coastal uh, Conservation uh, Association of Georgia, that's our saltwater folks, the Georgia Wildlife Federation, Quality Deer Management, uh, the Georgia Council of Trout Unlimited, the Southwest Georgia Chapter of uh, Quail Forever, and am I missing any? Did we, do you, did, do you, I don't know. And, and there may be more, I know we've, we've reached out to some of these folks, but if there's any to the audience that wants to speak to this, Welcome to, if not, and then uh, Commissioner, any any words that you? It, well, it's hard to follow, Reverend. I mean, yeah. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Representative Williams. But, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this good subcommittee here, and we had the great questions that were asked. I, we we started this over two years ago. Uh, this doesn't affect anybody but our customers, people that want to hunt and fish. We went to them in every corner of this state with those town hall meetings, and we feel real good that we have support of your constituents that, that are your voters that hunt and fish for this bill. Final question we asked them was how you want the money spent. Those lists you have in those packets didn't come from us. They came from that last question on our survey. So uh, I think I want to thank my staff. Uh, WRD for putting on those things and really listening to the public and letting them drive this process. So with that, I don't want to type any more of your time, and I appreciate your favorable consideration. H hold on a second, Mr. Commissioner. We, uh, uh, that's not you? Uh, okay. I start to say uh, he was going to ask you if you would stand for a question for the commission. He is my representative. Uh, well, now that you, you, you spawned one, <laughs> you better run. Uh, Am I recognized? Well, one, one last thing. Yes, I, I, you will be recognized at the right time. Commissioner, thank you. We worked hard. Uh, I know there's there's been some things, and in, in we've talked about it. We're going to come back every year as we do in our opening uh, committee meeting. We'll be able to talk to the uh, uh, to the commissioner and all the folks you know within the DNR and and get to listen and and talk about the new projects and the new things that this these resources are going to bring uh, to the state of Georgia. So thank you, commissioner, for what you do. Thank all of the department uh, heads and 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 all the folks within the the agency. So with that, uh, Representative uh, Chairman Nimmer, you are recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If this is the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion do pass. All right. We've got a second. So we've got uh, a motion to pass the uh, Game Fish and Parks uh, Committee Substitute HB 208. 
Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those like sign. And the bill passes. Now, hold on a second. I don't want anybody to get up and leave. We've got a good presentation here. We've got some folks from the Coastal Resources uh, uh, Department off the coast, and I think everybody will be presently surprised at, at what's going on on the Georgia coast. So if you can, uh, please stay for that. Uh, these guys are draw driven a long ways, and I think you'll find this very, very interesting. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Is it possible, you know, for us as a committee at some point after the session is over with to kind of take a tour of some of our parks and areas that we have responsibility for? Yeah, I, I, I think that's I, – not only do I think that we can, uh, Representative Bruce, I, I think it's a great idea. And, and maybe that's something that, that we can, you know, we, we can talk with the commissioner and, and, and start setting something up. Because I'm going to tell you guys, you look at all the agencies that are involved here, okay? Not only your parks, but the hunting and fishing part of this. You know, there's a lot in the state of Georgia, and we offer a, a great variety. And I'm sure that the commissioner and, and his department heads would, would, would love to do that. So, great suggestion. I, yeah, I just think it would be good for us to see. Well, I th I th you know, that, that leads, you know, guys, great question. And I think that this leads into probably as we start to evaluate things in the future and what are our needs, you know, let's get out there and see this. You know, we've got a great, we've got great assets, but how can we make them better? What are some future needs? So uh, Chairman, I think it's great. We, I think it's a great idea. No, I'm coming over here where I can watch. Okay. But, but I also would like to have, you all need to have a chance to break the world record. I sat down at Saplo with the size of a stingray. <laughs> Y'all should. It's not fair to hold this record as long as I've held it. You need to have a chance. Well, <laughs> Representative Williams, we will not be going down to the coast until the shrimp are <laughs> really in season now. I, the, the record is safe. No yeah. More. Yeah, but I'm saying we will we'll schedule our trip when the shrimp are in 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 season. All right, we're going we'll let these guys get set up. We just voted on the uh, on the license we get. So it is it is out. Good good stuff. So well. So now we're just gonna see a presentation. Yeah, but I'm telling you, I've th this. If, if you will, I, 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 I don't know if anybody can hear you or, or if you want to speak loud or if... I will speak loud. Okay. <laughs> so. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Spud Woodward. Uh, it's my pleasure to serve as the Director of the Coastal Resource Division. That looks like one of those fish in the Alcor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one right there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the chairman asked me to, uh, to come before y'all and give you a, an idea about some of the innovative things we're doing to help support saltwater fish management on the coast. And uh, anybody that's a fish biologist will tell you, you know, our, our business is complicated. We all wish that it was this simple. You know, the, a forester, they spend enough time in the woods, they can count all the trees. You know, a, a game biologist, if he spends enough time in the woods, he can count all the deer, he can count all the raccoons, he can count all the squirrels if he spends enough time in the woods. Don't argue, you can't. You got to spend enough time there. Us, it don't matter how much time we spend on the ocean, we can't count all the fish in it or in the estuary. So we, we have to use various tools 
And, and one of the things that we've used in support of fish management, fresh water and salt water all these years is conventional tagging. I mean, there's records of even, you know, John James Audubon actually tied string around the legs of birds that he would capture and then let them go to see if they were in that same place when he came back the next year. So uh, we've been tagging animals a long time, but there are limits to conventional tags. I mean, tags fall out, you depend on somebody catching the fish and then giving you the tag back and telling you where they caught them so you don't really know a lot about what happens from the time you let the fish go to the time somebody catches it. So there's a big missing uh, piece there. But uh, we still are able to use that information uh, to help inform our management decisions. Uh, this is a good example. We basically divide Atlantic Coast Red Drum. Red Drum is the state saltwater sport fish, a uh, very important species to our recreational fishermen. Because of tagging studies we've done, we basically split that population from North Carolina North and South Carolina South as a management unit. So we, we look at those animals slightly differently because they're the same species, but they don't necessarily mix and mingle with each other. And that's pretty fundamental information for, for managing the resource. But we've got some technology uh, that really empowers us to do things that we've never done before. And what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning is autonomous acoustic telemetry. So remember that tonight when you're having yeah, supper, you can, you can lay that on somebody <laughs> and, uh, and talk about acoustic, uh, autonomous acoustic telemetry. But what it basically comes down to is you've got a sonic transmitter that you attach or implant in the fish that gives off a coded signal. And then you can put a receiving unit out that can receive that signal, which is coded, and Doug is actually going to give you a demonstration. We, nobody gets scared. This is not a lie detector or anything like that. It's just a, this is actually each one of these has a unique signal that you record that signal and when you put it in a fish, and it allows you to identify that signal with that fish wherever it goes. Glad it's this one, not the big one. So this is actually the receiver. So this is what you put out in the water. So this receiver, when placed in the water, can detect that signal from up to 300 meters away. So, so roughly a thousand feet away. If something with that attached to them or inside them comes by, this is recording that every time it's close enough, and it's logging that date and that time and that signal. So you, you're able to confirm how long that animal is in proximity to this receiver. So each each one of these has a unique signal. That so is good, that, that tag right there is good for about three and a half years. So all this microcircuitry, better batteries, that stuff has really advanced our, our technology. So you put out these arrays, and so they sit out there and they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When we used to have to go out and stick a hydrophone in the water and go on little grids and all that kind of stuff. So the cool thing is we use universal equipment, so researchers all over the place are using this same equipment. So we get to share information and we form these regional consortiums. Uh, so here's some of the things we can do with that information, some very important practical applications. If you know where an animal is in time and space, and that helps you understand what its habitat needs are. If we don't have habitat, we don't have wildlife. So you've got to be able to connect the wildlife back to its habitat. Management boundaries. You know, our waters go out to three miles in the ocean. Beyond that, it's the federal government. So knowing where these fish are in time and space, who's governing those fish? Are y'all making the decisions? Is Congress making the decisions? Are you and Congress making the decisions? Um, changes in the environment, changes when we regulate fish. You know, fish are adaptable animals. They move <coughs> up and down the coast and uh, uh, as conditions change. The good the advantage of these, uh, these uh, tags we were using, we don't have to have a return from an angler. So we've got that, that's our, it's sitting out there listening all the time. They're less expensive than these satellite tags that you may have seen put on some of the big animals. They actually have to detach and come to the surface. You know, this is detected underwater. They have a high retention rates and long life batteries. So it really started our, our, our work in the, uh, the uh, autonomous acoustic telemetry and with triple tail. This is a very important recreational species in coastal Georgia. Uh, it's found around the world, but yet we know very little about it. I mean, it's very much a mystery fish. And so our, our biologists put out some receivers in the Osabaw estuary. This is basically the terminus of the Ogeechee River and began to just study what, what are triple tail doing in the Osabaw estuary? Because we knew they were there, they're being caught by fishermen, uh, but we don't know a lot about why they're there, how long are they there, uh, where are they going when they leave there? So we took that size transmitter, surgically implanted in triple tail. And this is the kind of information we, we gained. This is year two, but it shows you that basically triple tails are living in the Osabaw estuary 
from summer to the fall, which corresponds roughly with the period of warm water temperatures. Now the very interesting thing is, and we had 57 fish that we ultimately used in this project, a couple of them were caught by fishermen you see here, is that our neighbors to the south, there's several groups in Florida that are putting out these similar arrays. You see all these dots indicate receiver arrays. So combination, you know, multiple numbers of these receivers. And so we found out that when our fish left, this is where they went, because they picked our fish up on their arrays down south and then reported it back to us. So what we found out is we're sharing a population of triple tail between coastal Georgia and South Florida. And so that means a lot of things. One is that, you know, they have their home bodies, these fish are coming back. We had one individual female that made two complete migratory trips. She went down to Florida, spent the winter, managed to not get caught and eaten, came all the way back up, spent the whole summer, went all the way down to Florida again, came all the way back again. They managed to somehow evade getting caught and eaten in the process, which is pretty amazing. And this was a fish probably about, about that size. Uh, so, you know, our estuaries are home to these fish. They're, they're important habitat. Uh, we've got this seasonal migration, so not only are we important, but this area down here is important. But what is really important is that we're sharing these fish and we need to manage them together. Because if they over harvest them down here, or we over harvest them up here, then nobody's going to benefit from it. So we took that project and then we, we partnered up with South Carolina to do a, uh, an expanded project using acoustic telemetry on Atlantic sturgeon. It was uh, been listed as an endangered species by the federal government. Uh, again, we don't know a lot about what it does in the ocean. You know, they migrate up our freshwater rivers. They spawn. They're anadromous, so they live in salt water. They spawn in freshwater. They go up the Savannah, the Ogeechee, the, the Altamaha, uh, the Okmulgee, the Oconee, the St. Mary's. Uh, they spawn in those areas. But what we really need to understand is more about what are they doing in the ocean. So South Carolina has acoustic arrays off of their waters, and then we have an array that we established down here off of the Golden Isles area. And what we did is we used already available aids to navigation to attach the receivers to the ones. And this, this is the St. Simon's ship channel. So this is St. Simon's, this is Jekyll Island, Brunswick's back over here. So we have these receivers attached to these aids to navigation. And then we went out and anchored eight receivers to the seafloor here at roughly one mile intervals, starting at about six miles out to 14 miles. This passes through F Reef, which is one of our state managed uh, man-made reefs. And then we came down here off of Little Cumberland and we did another array of eight down here off of, and they passed through A Reef, which is another one of our man-made reefs. So we're getting information on use of our man-made reefs as well as how these fish are moving up and down the coast. But this shows you one of our underwater arrays right there. Uh, this is a little close up. This is how we're attaching them to the aids and navigation. We had to coordinate this with the Coast Guard. They're responsible for maintaining these aids and navigation. So we can go out in a boat and pretty much retrieve these from the surface. But the ones on the seafloor were a little bit more logistically challenging. First, we had to find a housing for this that could hold up to the rigors of the undersea environment. The constant pressure, and you can see what the pressure did to this is one of our first versions here. This started basically crushing it. Then we got a fancy store-bought buoy like you would mark a boating safety zone with. Well, they didn't hold up either, so ultimately came back and were able to configure our own buoy here because we needed something that was durable, uh, easy to work underwater, uh, and also as visible as it could be. So again, that's, that shows that. And what I've got now is a little bit of footage of diving, um, and I'll give you a little uh, overview of it. So. So we take two divers out and we service these about once every three months. So we go out and we bring the receiver up and we download its content with a Bluetooth wireless connection on board the boat and we send back down a fresh receiver with a new battery in it, put it back down on the seafloor. So we find, the, we find this in its housing with the sonar to send a, uh, a dive team down. Uh, we've already dropped a marker float with one of these in a housing attached to it and a search line. Uh, so that we can't see it from our immediate descent and we have to go on the search grid around to try to find it. So uh, you can see the water goes from that nice clear at the surface down to this more pea green, which is kind of indicative of where our, our waters look off the coastal Georgia. And in this case, what the divers are doing first, this is, this is an already deployed receiver. 
but this uh, uh, this tie down was beginning to succumb to the effects of the ocean. So what we did is we sent down a new tie down. Basically, this is like a trailer tie down. You're gonna see them screwing it into the to the seafloor mm -hmm. so that we can put a new one out and then we'll remove uh, the old one. So uh, we're doing this, like I say, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So the water temperatures, in this case, this is summer, and water temperature is pretty balmy. It's probably in the upper 80s or so. And uh, you can dive and be pretty comfortable. We just serviced the array a couple of weeks ago, and it was 59 degrees. A uh, little different, a little shorter list of diving volunteers in <laughs> January than there is in July. I can, I can assure you of that. Um, but a lot of times, you know, the water is very murky, and, and one of the challenges is actually finding it, and you do a lot of this work by feel when you can't necessarily see very far. So they'll, uh, they'll screw this in, uh, get it cinched down, basically like a trailer tie down. Into the sand. Yeah, the into the Florida ocean. ocean. Manufactured so housing tie downs. Excuse me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. 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 I know there's boat trailers and, yeah. It's so the same dirt, ocean floor. Rip, rip, rip. That, that's just that's sand. That's the sand, mud, bottom of the Atlantic Ocean right there. And this is this is in about 45 feet of water. So see, they've attached a new housing to it, and this one will be picked back up and removed, and then they ascend back up. And uh, it usually takes that dive is probably seven or eight minutes. So you're you're going and servicing each one of them. And this was obviously, as you'll see in a second, a beautiful day on the ocean. Look at how flat it was come up and then the uh, our research vessel the Marguerite over here uh, recovers the divers and you go to the next one and you basically leapfrog doing this. Marguerite? Yeah. Marga 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 Marguerite. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. All right so um, the focus of this project current project is sturgeon uh, and this is just some idea of some of the things with these are sturgeon have been released in these states and these locations and picked back up on our array. So we've got 179 sturgeon with transmitters that we have detected on our arrays off the coastal of Georgia. 90,000 detections. Uh, the farthest distance has been 785 miles that a fish traveled from its point of origin to coastal Georgia. The really interesting thing we're able to do with this is, unlike with conventional tags, we can fill in the gaps. Where, where are they in time? And so we, you can do this visualization, uh, visualization analysis what we know about sturgeon is they generally spend the winter and the cooler months in the ocean and then they migrate back into the rivers in the spring to spawn and sometimes they'll stay in the rivers in the thermal refuge in the, in the summer. Sometimes they'll move back out uh, to the ocean and go northward because they cannot tolerate the hot water. And our ocean water will get to almost 90 degrees in the summertime. So what you see here is by season. So this is the winter time. You've got the bigger this dot is, the more detections we had on our array. So you can see here sturgeon are using our coastal waters very heavily during the winter months. Then in the spring, they begin to disperse. You don't get nearly as many relocations. See some of these fish are going up the rivers, and some are probably going back up north. And then in the summer, very few detections. Again, that's not their suitable habitat during the summer. And then in the fall, you see them coming back again, and you're starting to see those. So, so this area right here is important habitat for sturgeon that are using the entire Atlantic coast. Um, the other most powerful thing about this is that there are 36 groups that are doing similar work up and down the Atlantic coast and in the Bahamas. <coughs> they're putting out rays, they're releasing fish with, with transmitters in them. And so this has given us the ability to pick up a lot of animals. So thus far, <coughs> in the roughly two and a half years of our project, we have detected 31 different species of marine life, uh, ranging from a variety of shark species as well as the sturgeon, uh, bull sharks, cobia. Cobia is one that we're in very interested in. It's managed uh, by the federal government. Uh, actually, they have proposed a closure of federal waters right now because of overharvest of cobia in the northern part of their range. So the more we learn about cobia, the more we may be able to refine those management decisions to be more beneficial to all the states in their range and not you know, definitely you know, penalize the state in the south because of what's going on to the north. Um, Barracuda, Goliath grouper, uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, lemon sharks, these were actually released in Bimini over in the Bahamas, and uh, tarpon, tiger sharks, and this one always evokes a lot of interest, the, the great white shark. We have detected 36 great white sharks, um, 
from New England off of the coast of Georgia. And uh, in fact, we were diving, I guess it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And when he came back up and started downloading the content of one of the receivers, we, we found out that there had been a great white detection on that receiver six days before we were diving on it. So, so that's just, you know, part of the job, I guess. That's why we all have good insurance, you know, so. <laughs> Well, it's considered endangered by the federal government, but, but the states dispute that. That's, yeah. that's been a contentious issue. We, and, and part of what we're learning from this is, may, you know, there could be a lot more sturgeon than, and they don't need to be listed as endangered, because when they're listed as endangered, then it creates a host of unintended consequences, like makes it very difficult for us to even do research work with, because now you've got to have permits to handle them and do all this basic work. So. Uh, the the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, they continue to be, you know, a, a threatened species. But uh, you can see here, and, and uh, you know, that's the number of individuals that we've detected of that species, and that's the number of detections. So you can see a lot of these species, we're, they're out there for a long period of time using the habitat off the coast of Georgia. Here's a little bit more about the shark detections and where they come from. You've got tiger sharks here that were released in... South Carolina, we got uh, bull sharks and black nose and fine tooths that were released off of, of uh, Cape Canaveral down here. You've got sand tigers coming out of Delaware and then these great whites that were released, tag and released up in New England. We also have a lot of, of fish that are of interest to recreational fishermen that we're trying to learn more about them, you know, trying to fill in the gaps in our knowledge so we can manage them more effectively. Cobia, like I've talked about, you've got, we've detected cobia that were released in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. One Goliath grouper from down here in extreme South Florida, black drum and red drum from Cape Canaveral area, red drum from Georgia, tarpon from Georgia, and then obviously triple, numerous triple tail. So this is filling in gaps that are sometimes critical missing information in our ability to make good informed management decisions. Uh, we're currently working and taking this same array that we use for triple tail up in Osaba, and we're using it for red drum and our sort of management paradigm has always been that when red drum reach adulthood, which is roughly age five or six, they spend the winters offshore in the open Atlantic Ocean. We have already found out that some of these adult red drum are actually spending the winter inside the estuary. Uh, so we've already learned something that we didn't know was going on just from this initial survey. So that's real quick, but it's a, it's a powerful tool. It's, its power is amplified by the fact that we're cooperating with states and other countries around us. We're all building a better body of knowledge. Uh, we, this work's been funded by Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration, which is one of the, 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 the funding sources that will increase if we certify more anglers in Georgia, as well as funds from NOAA. So with that, just, uh, and that's just to show you that I do more than come up here and aggravate y'all. Yeah, he does get paid to do that. I can't believe it. Remember, um, that, water, that water was 59 degrees. Well, oh, you know, oh, I'm not oh, concerned oh. about the water. I'm concerned about the uh, uh, the critters that are in the water. That's that's amazing with the great white sharks when people probably years ago, you even told me you didn't think there were any great white sharks. There are many out there. Uh, yeah, we always thought that there might be a rare occurrence, but uh, there are definitely more of them out there now than we thought. And, that's probably a function of there's we've managed a lot of these other species so there's more food for them. Mm -hmm. They're probably eating some of those adult red drum. In fact, I related to you a story where one of our fishermen had a group of young anglers at that F artificial reef was catching adult red drum in, in the wintertime and actually had a great white sky one like you see if they do the seals come up and engulf the whole thing and roll back over and they oohed and they odd and they pulled the anchor and they left. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Spud, if you don't mind, I know we got a, a couple of questions and comments, and, and, and I'm going to let the committee do it. And I'm going to say before we end, I want to talk about two things that, that you said something about Kobe, and I think this is important, and then artificial reefs. But before we get to that, I'm going to let the committee start. Uh, who is number six? That would be me. Oh, that would be uh, all right, Chairman Nimmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Spud, for your presentation and the work you all do on the coast. Um, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman, if I may. 
what, what's the benefit, and in all seriousness, what's the benefit of introducing sharks in the new water? I think about three slides back, you were, I think Fine Tooth was one of the sharks you were talking about introducing. Uh, why, why, are, why are sharks introduced into an area? Well, we're uh, not introducing them. They're, they're just showing up. Yeah, they're, they're occurring. They're just showing up. Okay, I, I'm words, sorry. I, I, they're I, introducing I, themselves yeah, is what. Yeah, they're showing up at the party. Okay. <laughs> All right, I got you. Well, then, uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, uh, Mr. Spud, in the next one, do you anticipate the uh, white shark population to grow off of the coast right right down around the Golden Isles? Uh, obviously, I'm assuming that answer is yeah, but I want to hear it qualified by you. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's an awful leading question there, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get evidence to my wife while we don't need to go to the beach anymore. We need to go to the mountains. Uh, no. Oh, easy now. Easy now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd do sand dance instead of great white shark. <laughs> uh, but do you, you hate to comment on that either well, way. There, I think the, the shark populations are benefiting from conservation efforts to protect them. I mean, they, you know, they've suffered a lot of overfishing. Now, you know, the, the great white sharks are, are not something we should ever worry about. Okay. I mean, they're, they're generally there in the cooler times of the year. Nobody's out there swimming. Unless, there is a multitude of other sharks that are there during the summer. Unless, <laughs> unless, you're, at, unless you're at the F Reef and one skies to get a, a drum, right? Uh, one, one last question, and this is to you, Mr. Spud, back to Representative Williams. I noticed three types of rays listed on your list, a rough tail, a blunt nose, and a cow nose. Which one does he hold the record? It's a southern stingray. So he, his, his ray doesn't even make the list. His list doesn't even. <laughs> I, I can verify that his was a very I was there. No, I was there. I witnessed the epic. But, <laughs> but I, I appreciate it's amazing. It's amazing what the coast of Georgia hosts uh, once you get off off the dry land. And I, I appreciate what you do uh, with a, with a district that borders close to the coastal waters. There, uh, I know it's very important. A lot of my constituents recreate and and have a way of life down there and, and I appreciate y'all's efforts in maintaining and sustaining. Uh, is that Nimmer, I mean, uh, uh, Don, uh, Representative Donahue down there. And again, thank you for your presentation. A couple of quick questions. I've been diving 40 years and you're right, 59 is very cold. With the implant, you're making an incision, you're sliding this in, are you gluing it and then allowing it to heal or how do you? So you're suturing it, actually, okay. And then that suture just disappears, it heals, and you keep up with that. And you said it lasts for like three years in the fish also? Well, the transmitter's battery life is typically a little over three, but that's something that lasts as long as four. Okay. And it'll, it, it basically will sit inside that fish, be encapsulated in mesentery tissue, and it's just benign. And, and if you're looking at the coast, you're still having lots of sharks that come up on that first bar when you're at the beach and you think you're really safe there's a ton of shark that come through there and feed different things that people never pay attention to that's right. still pretty much what you're finding there's a, there's a lot of sharks down there you know right. and it's, it's it's the best thing to do is if, if you see a, a, a bunch of bait fish don't go wading through a bunch of bait fish don't swim at dawn and don't swim at dusk you know, okay. get out there during the, the brighter times of the day and uh, you know, we're very fortunate we have not had the shark human interactions that you hear about to the north and south of us, and we were trying to keep that record up. There you Thank you. Let, let Spud tell you offline of his uh, shark running between his legs. So, yeah. Uh, who, who's number one? Representative Riccio. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. There you go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I noticed on this little transmitter, it says that there is a, a reward if found in my. My no no, but uh, my my uh, middle son and I killed a dove several years ago that was banded, and we had to call this number and check in. They sent us a certificate and all that. What what is it? What does a fisherman do? I see a phone number on here. What happens when they catch a fish? You said they caught a couple of triple tail right. with some transmitters. W what happens then? What's the reward and kind of what's the little process? Yeah, we so do they owe me a hundred dollars for that dove I killed? You think? You got to talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service about that. I knew there was some money missing in that little deal. 
They're a little more sensitive with their money than we are. But, but you get this back? But, but seriously, can we, you reuse it? We get it back and we can rebatter it. Amen. Yeah, so it's worth a lot of money to recover one. So. Guys, two things that I've that I mentioned, and I want, I want to make sure that we can. This is very serious because I, I think what, what, what I want to make sure that the committee understands that there's a lot of what we can make laws about influence rules and all that you know the, the the power of the elected seat that we hold but there's a lot of decision making that goes on and there's a lot to all this and uh, there are two things I, I want to first maybe a brief artificial reefs and then I, I want to end on cobia because this is something that is going to affect our fishermen this year and so the more and more we know about how we manage the, the, our, our salt waters, our, our, our coast and our salt waters, uh, it's just not about us. I mean, in a lot of cases, it's about uh, these regional uh, uh, commissions that are set up. So with that, Spud, uh, briefly the artificial reefs, because that is something that our, our sports, uh, our fishermen are, are paying for and it's creating good habitat. And then, and then finally, Cobia, because that may be something that we as legislators want to pay particular uh, attention to. Uh, if you'll think back to that video and what the seafloor looked like in that video, it was just sort of a flat, unremarkable expanse of sand and mud. That's generally what the seafloor off the coast of Georgia looks like until you get to about 40 miles offshore. It looks like the beach. When you walk on the beach, that's what it looks like generally offshore. So back in the 70s, the, the department started putting out clean man-made material because when you put that material down on the bottom it becomes colonized by a diversity of marine life that can't exist on that shifting sand mud bottom and it started off with ships we actually had two liberty ships that were built in coastal georgia that were surplus we actually took those and sunk them offshore in the 70s and since that time we've used concrete um, army tanks new york city subway cars we make sure it's clean, doesn't have any contaminants in it, but when you put that material out there, then it becomes an oasis in the ocean for, for life. Small fish attract big fish, big fish attract fishermen. And so we're creating fishing opportunities. Uh, and we have, uh, we have 22 uh, reef sites uh, that we maintain scattered from seven, as close as three miles offshore out to about 60 or 70 miles offshore. The vast majority of them are between uh, seven and 20 miles and uh, they create fishing opportunities that simply wouldn't exist and so we use a combination of fishing license revenues and federal aid and sport fish revenues as well as a lot of donations from the private sector I mean right now uh, <coughs> the uh, Glen County is trucking waste concrete from a demolition project over to a staging area and we will take that and put it on barges and carry it offshore and create habitat for fish there where there isn't any habitat now mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very important project. Uh, it, it creates diversity in the ocean and it also creates fishing opportunities and diving opportunities that wouldn't exist. So, um, Representative Williams, that's what keeps us and the rest of Georgia wanting to come down to your district. Well, come down and see. Uh, no, seriously. Stop telling them about when we drop them out here. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I, I mean, I you, you think about that. It's uh, instead of going to Florida as we, as we increase what we have here in Georgia, not only is it a great inshore, and and, and 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 all but you know, as we do things like that we, we we continue to provide more opportunities and you know that's good for everybody um all right i think uh, chairman nimmer thank you mr chairman mr spud um i know you and i have talked in the past about fish limits trout spot tail different things and maybe some of the other members have heard those questions before if you could just kind of uh, get give them the reason why we have the limits that we do uh and and i'll throw one little commercial in there um sounds to me like if we go ahead and raise them we won't have a threat of white sharks we'll take some of their buffet away okay. but uh <laughs> but uh but no i know you and i've talked in the past sure. about it and that continues to be something i'm asked about from my fishermen around home right well Animal populations are, are variable in abundance, and, you know, and the goal of perpetuating consistent opportunities is trying to maintain consistent abundance of those animal populations. And all, all these species are not created equal. Some mature at smaller sizes and younger ages than others do. So, so each management description to preserve them and to keep those populations abundant has to be based on the specifics of the animal. And 
So our harvest regulations reflect how we're trying to understand that animal, its biology, its life cycle, and then allow some removal of that animal by fishing, yet leave enough out there to perpetuate the species into the future. It's like, like Representative Williams said, I mean, it's all about perpetuating them sustainable, keeping them into the future. But we deal with, you know, we've got dozens of species that are being targeted by recreational anglers, so we're always sort of behind the curve trying to understand enough to have the basis. But, you know, just to compare and contrast, you've got red drum, called spot-tailed bass, channel bass, and then you got spotted sea trout. They're both members of the same family of fishes, but a spotted sea trout can mature at age 12, I mean, at a year, one year of age and a length of 12 inches. A red drum doesn't reach maturity until it's four or five years old and a length of 30 or 36 inches. So you've got to manage those two fish completely differently. I mean, we'd all like in a simple world is have one length limit and one bag limit for everything, <laughs> but we can't do that. We have to we have to do the management prescription specific to the animal itself. So that's really the, the underpinnings of it is and just like this information. I mean, this information all feeds into that decision making process. Well, again, I thank you. I know we had discussions about it in the past, and I know I, I Representative Williams and I down on the coast will continue to get questions about it. When well, and, and or is that would be like the slot limit with the trout? Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot of times this is guys, and I, this is a great point to talk about right here, and, and I'm, I'm going to leave two seconds for the cobia because I think this is important. But, you know, we I remember Representative Williams, you called me about the, the, the slot limit. We talked to Spud. But, you know, a year, a year or two later, what's happening? Spud? Yeah, I mean, I, the people the, have had a good they were having one of the best trout season with better and bigger trout, okay? And that's sort of where we're not, again, we're not trying to, to, to tell you you can't, but it's, 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 it's a management. And I think that's where we as a committee need to be listening to what these guys are telling us. Uh, yeah, it hurt that first year, and some of our fishermen were, were hey, you're, you know, you're, I can't do it. But the next year, the same next year they came in, and all of a sudden they've got a great trout season, and they're, they're, in general, from I think general feedback, are catching a better quality or size of trout. And so that's important for us to know as we start to discern political wants and, and all of our constituents to really, uh, I would say, almost being able to say, look, guys, we hear you, but there's another way to get to it, and the way to get to it is through a little science and data, and we're going to be able to give you that great trout fishery. Just bear with us a year or so. still able to go out on the river at the right tide, the morning tide, and catch a bushel of big blues in less than an hour. And that's throwing back the ones who just didn't meet the side. And we'll get back there, but we would have done that 50 years ago. So we had to come back from all those situations. Yeah. Real quick, uh, uh, Representative Donahue, and then I want to talk real quick before everybody leaves about the cobia because this, this will affect our fishermen. I want to make sure that the committee knows it, okay? And, and real quick, I have a meeting here in a couple minutes. Thank you for the bringing this, for everything we're working toward. I have a lot of questions from people when we fish in Florida. They're very upset, of course, with, uh, I guess you could say, research of closing this season and then opening this for a short period. And they ask, we're not looking at that in Georgia, we hope. And I always tell them, well, we have biologists that are always there concerned about what's best for our future. But I'm getting more and more, and I'm not from the coast, but I do try to fish a lot down uh, in the panhandle. And I just know everywhere you go, people, friends of mine that have boats, they complain because it's, it's hard for them to make a living. We're not headed down that path by no means, I'm sure. Well, but, but you know not, but this may go into the, yeah. the cobia issue that tie, ties in, guys. Yeah. Yeah, and that is the, 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 the regional, uh, you, you do it. I, go, go into that, Spud, about the, the cobia and the regional management. To answer your question is, you know, a closed season is the last thing you want to do. Right. But as much as I pick on my colleagues here in game management, we do have one advantage. People can have a satisfactory experience catching releasing fish 
shooting and release becomes a little more problematic. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so that's the last thing you want to do. You know, you want to make sure you use the other management tools in your toolbox before you put people off the water. And that does feed into the situation with Covia. Is right now, Covia is, is managed by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council under federal law. Uh, we have state regulations on Covia, and the, the compact of the East Coast states, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, is working on an interstate plan. But because too many Covia are being caught in North Carolina and to a greater extent Virginia, the regional administrator for the National Marine Fisheries Service has decided that uh, it is too risky to allow continued harvest of, of Covia in federal waters. Uh, for 2017, so he basically issued an emergency order to close the whole Kobe fishing season for the Atlantic coast. And but that doesn't really stop the problem because 80% of the Kobe that are being caught on the eastern seaboard are being caught in state water. So North Carolina and Virginia will continue to be able to catch their fish, but yet Georgia fishermen fish almost exclusively in federal waters for Kobe because that's where they're at. They're not in our state waters, and so we're not going to have a Kobe fishing opportunity for the state of Georgia. And, and just today, the commissioner sent a letter to the regional administrator of the National Marine Fisheries Service and said, you know, we, we disagree vehemently with this. We think that you're disadvantaging Georgia fishermen unfairly uh, for something that they're not creating the problem because we're not, we're not the over-harvesting problem on COVID. But it speaks to the complications of the state of Georgia. You have no authority outside of three miles. And when that three-mile line in the ocean, uh, beyond that, it is the purview of Congress federal government so those those are the rules we live under yeah and i believe you you were you were discussing that that virginia or maybe it's chesapeake Bay, where i guess virginia the, 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 they harvested the, the the limit for our area our region was 800 and something thousand pounds well 620 thousand pounds for the region from from uh, north Carolina, from georgia to new york but they harvested they are, yeah, pretty much yes they're harvesting seven or eight hundred thousand pounds so they're already harvesting more than what the whole allotment is okay and as spud said georgia fishermen are going three miles off that's where we catch them so now we're 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 done for 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 17 there is there's no cobia but yet in those states because they're inside of state waters they're going to continue to over harvest those fish which like he said it's back and forth. It's, you know, if, if it's overfished there, then, you know, the other area that they're traveling to, they're, they're out too. So that's sort of why a lot of what we do on this committee has to fit together and we have to be knowledgeable about what these guys are doing and how we interplay with other regions. And, and th that could be said in, you know, also migratory birds from that point of view, because those birds are flying state to state. But I do want to make this committee aware as we make decisions and we hear issues from constituents and they're only looking at the right here and now, this is a much bigger issue, okay? And there's a lot more factors involved in it than just, you know, what somebody saw locally or, or, or on our coast or maybe in their part of uh, Georgia. A lot of times these decisions are, 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 are multifaceted. How are we able to set artificial limits 60 miles off the coast get a regional permit from the Corps of Engineers to be able to put them out in federal waters. Okay. So, so they're our responsibility, but under authority from the federal government. Guys, I hope this has been informative. I've, I, I love the coast. And I love going down there. But every time I hear more and more about it, it tells you how interesting uh, our, our salt water is. Thank Spud, you thank you, uh, uh, Doug. Thank you all for coming up. Very, very informative. If y'all want to st stick around for a second, these guys may have some questions.